The clean energy future is not being decided by shiny cars or tall wind towers. It is being decided by what happens when the wind stops and the sun goes down. Everyone says the world is going electric, but that promise breaks the moment power turns uneven. So the real battle is storage. Who can capture extra energy, hold it safely, and release it right on time? Batteries lead today, yet rivals are coming from strange angles. Gravity, water, underground systems, and ocean devices all want a piece of the grid. The next decade will show which idea scales fastest. Why storage becomes the real race. Across the world, research labs and power companies are chasing the same missing piece. Wind is not constant. Solar fades every evening and weakens in winter storms. If transport, heating and industry move toward electricity, the grid must handle long quiet hours without collapse. That turns energy storage into the backbone of the transition. Storage does two jobs at once. It soaks up surplus power when farms are overproducing, and it fills the gap when demand spikes. Without that buffer, renewable capacity has to be overbuilt and still risks outages. Storage is also more than a box of cells. It has to be managed minute by minute. Charging at the wrong time can overload lines. Discharging too early can leave a city short later. So software becomes part of the product. Algorithms forecast demand, watch prices, and decide when to store and when to release. They also coordinate thousands of units, so they behave like one large plant. This is why storage is a competition that looks like hardware on the outside, but behaves like logistics on the inside. When storage works, renewable power stops being a gamble and starts behaving like a steady service. Tesla's software moat and battery rivals. Battery competition is not a future threat. It already exists. Large suppliers such as LG Chem and C8 Cell sell battery cells and grid storage systems. And many other firms do the same. So the question isn't whether rivals can build packs. The question is what separates one storage provider from another. One argument is that Tesla's edge is the control layer. Better software can earn more money from the same physical capacity by reacting faster to grid signals and by stacking services. That can include frequency support, peak shaving, and backup power during faults. It can also include smarter scheduling, so the pack cycles less for the same revenue, which extends life. Another argument is manufacturing. Efficient factories lower costs and improve reliability through constant iteration. Small design changes can reduce parts, speed assembly, and cut failure rates. Grid operators pay for speed and trust, so proven control systems get rewarded. Still, even strong rivals may not catch a leader in the usual way, because the market is expanding so quickly. In a fast-growing market, several players can win at the same time, especially when the goal is to replace fossil fuel power, not to fight over a fixed pie. Gravity batteries, water, rocks, and reversible power. While batteries dominate headlines, gravity storage keeps returning because it uses simple physics. The classic version is pumped hydro. Water is released downhill through turbines to generate electricity, then pumped back up when there is spare power. In many regions, it is among the lowest cost ways to store huge amounts of energy for hours or even days. Its weakness is geography. It needs height, reservoirs, permits, and enough water, and those are not available everywhere. A related idea replaces water with heavy objects. Large blocks, boulders, or tall containers filled with sand can be lifted and then lowered. As the weight descends, it turns a generator. The system behaves like a turbine when moving down. When power is cheap, motors pull the weight back up, storing energy again. The logic is clear. Falling stores energy. Lifting spends energy. These projects aim to discharge at night or during calm weather, when renewables dip. They can be built near cities, on industrial land, or next to mines, which helps. But the engineering is harder than the sketch. Massive moving parts must survive for years with low maintenance, and the best sites still need space and elevation. If the site is wrong, even cheap physics becomes an expensive project. Why falling battery costs can crowd out alternatives? Another view says most alternatives will struggle as battery prices keep falling. 
battery systems directly benefit from scale. More factories mean better yields, simpler assembly, and cheaper supply chains. That learning curve has played out many times in electronics. Gravity systems often rely on construction, land, and custom mechanical structures. Those inputs do not always fall in price. Concrete, steel, permits, and long build times can hold costs steady, or even push them up. So even if gravity storage works, it may not get cheaper at the same pace as mass-produced battery packs. This does not mean gravity disappears. It means the niche matters. Pumped hydro can shine where a site already exists, where a dam can be built with low impact, or where long duration storage is needed. Heavy block systems can shine where land is cheap and maintenance crews are close. But in many places, a containerized battery that can be dropped onto a pad, wired up quickly and controlled by software will stay hard to beat. In that sense, the strongest competition is not storage versus storage, but clean storage versus the old fossil system that still runs much of the grid. Megapack pricings, backlogs, and the 300 terawatt hour gap. Near-term pricing depends on how big the gap is between supply and demand. One estimate often discussed is that the world may need on the order of 300 terawatt hours of deployed batteries and battery-like products over time. Even if production ramps fast, that target is enormous. Imagine an industry producing 10 terawatt hours of storage products per year. Even at that scale, reaching 300 terawatt hours of deployment could take decades. That size helps explain why price pressure can stay weak for years. A buyer is not only purchasing a box of energy, a buyer is purchasing avoided blackouts, avoided gas peaker plants, and lower grid fees. That value can justify high prices while the grid is tight. It also explains why top products can sell with long wait lists. Megapack pricing has been quoted around $3.9 million to about $4 million for a 3.9 megawatt hour unit and some buyers have faced long lead times in busy periods. When customers still line up at that level, suppliers have little reason to cut aggressively until capacity catches up. So competition exists, but it can look strangely calm because everyone is still selling into a shortage. Some observers argue that thinking only about gravity batteries or rival battery brands misses the real battlefield. For most customers, the alternative is still coal, natural gas, or oil-based generation that can run on demand. As long as those plants set the marginal price on many grids, clean storage can charge premium rates because it helps push those plants out of the schedule. Grid electricity prices can also rise during the transition, especially before wind and solar reach a very high share. In that phase, storage is not fighting a price war with other clean tools. It is helping every clean tool win together. Mines, ocean bladders, and the S-curve. There is also a practical reason to expect more variety. A shortage attracts inventors. During a supply vacuum, new players appear with different approaches that fit special environments. Some concepts use old mines or underground shafts. A heavy load can ride up and down in a vertical tunnel, turning a generator on the way down and storing energy on the way up. Some use deep caverns to store compressed air, then release it through turbines when power is needed. Others move into the ocean. One proposal places large flexible bladders on the sea floor near offshore wind farms. When excess power is available, pumps inflate the bladder against water pressure, storing energy as compressed volume. When power is needed, the bladder deflates and drives equipment that returns electricity to the grid. Such systems can avoid some fire risks and recycling issues of batteries, and saltwater sites can offer long lifetimes if materials hold up. No one can predict which idea will become the surprise winner in the next seven years. That uncertainty feeds the S-curve debate. Early on, demand outruns supply, and almost any working storage earns money. Later, when supply and demand start to meet, the curve flattens and prices are forced down. Some expect that shift around 2028 or 2029, when build-outs finally begin to match the need. That is why some forecasts place the tightest period around 2027 and 2028, when build-outs accelerate, but supply chains still lag. 
In that window, many storage approaches can look profitable at once. The disagreement is about when the turning point arrives. If new factories, new chemistries, and new non-battery systems ramp fast, the flattening could appear by 2028 or 2029. If ramping is slower, the shortage could stretch beyond 2030. Either way, the curve only climbs if enough products exist to fill it, and that pressure invites constant experimentation. Storage is moving from the side story to the main plot. The grid cannot live on sunshine and wind alone, so every plan needs a way to bank power. Batteries will likely dominate because they scale fast and work almost anywhere. Yet gravity systems, mine shafts, and ocean pressure ideas can win where local conditions favor them. Software will matter because it turns stored energy into usable power at the right second. The biggest rivalry is clean energy versus fossil fuels, because that is where the market sits. When storage becomes abundant, prices will fall, and the electric future will feel steady.